Chapter 7 The first thing I notice is the smell. Leather, wood, polish, with a faint citrus scent. It's very pleasant. And the lighting is soft, subtle. In fact, I can't see the source. But it's around the cornice of the room, emitting an ambient glow. The walls and ceiling are a deep dark burgundy, giving a womb-like effect to the spacious room. And the floor is old, old varnished wood. There is a large wooden cross like an X fastened to the wall facing the door. It's made of eye polished mahogany and there are restraining cuffs on each corner. Above it is an expansive iron grid suspended from the ceiling, eight foot square at least, and from it hang all manner of ropes, chains and glinting shackles. By the door two long polished ornately carved poles like spindles from a banister, but longer hang like curtain rods across the wall. From them swing a startling assortment of paddles, whips, riding crops and funny looking feathery implements. Beside the door stands a substantial mahogany chest of drawers, each drawer slim as if designed to contain specimens in a crusty old museum. I wonder briefly what the drawers actually do. Hold. Do I want to know? In the far corner is an ox blood leather padded bench and fixed to the wall beside it is a wooden polished rack that looks like a pool or billiard cue holder but on closer inspection it holds, it holds canes and varying lengths and widths. There's a stout six foot long table in the opposite corner polished wood with carved le legs and two matching stools underneath but what dominates the room is a bed it's bigger than king sized an ornately carved four poster with a flat top. It looks late 19th century. Under the canopy I can see more gleaming chains and cuffs. There is no bedding, just a mattress covered in red leather and red satin cushion piled on one end. At the foot of the bed, set apart a few feet, is a large oxblood Chesterfield couch just stuck in the middle of the room, facing the bed. An odd arrangement to have a couch facing the bed and I smile to myself. I've picked on the couch as odd when really it's the most mundane piece of furniture in the room. I glance up and stare at the ceiling. There are carabiners all over the ceiling at odd intervals. I vaguely wonder what they're for. Weirdly, all the wood, dark walls, moody lighting and ox blood leather makes the room kind of soft and romantic. I know it's anything but this. It's Christian's version of soft and romantic. I turn and he's regarding me intently as I knew he would be. His expression completely unreadable. I walk farther into the room and he follows me. The feathery thing has me intrigued. I touch it hesitantly. It swayed like a small cat of nine tails but bushier and there are very small plastic beads on the end. It's called a flogger, Christian's voice is quiet and soft. A flogger? Hmm, I think I'm in shock. My subconscious has emigrated or been struck dumb or simply killed over and expired. I am numb. I can observe and absorb but not articulate my feelings about all this because I'm in shock. What is the appropriate response to finding out a potential lover is a completely freaky sadist? Fear, yes, that seems to be the overriding feeling. I recognise it now. But weirdly, not of him. I don't think he'd hurt me. Well, not without my consent. So many questions cloud my mind. Why? How? When? How often? Who? I walk around the bed and run my hands down one of the calf posts. The post is very sturdy, a craftsmanship, outstanding. Say something, Christian commands. His voice, soft. Do you do this to people or do they do it to you? His mouth quirks up, either, amused or relieved. People, he blinds a couple of times as he considers his answer. I do this to women, who wants me to? I don't understand. But if you have willing volunteers, why am I here? Because I want to do it with you.
very much. Oh, I gasp. Why? I wander to the far corner of the room and pat the waist eye padded bench and run my fingers over the lever. He likes to hurt women. The thought depresses me. You're a sadist. No, I'm a dominant. His eyes are a scorching grey intense. What does that mean? I whisper. It means I want you to willingly surrender yourself to me in all things. I frown at him as I try to assimilate this idea. Why would I do that? To please me, he whispers, as he cocks his head to one side, and I see a ghost of a smile. Please him? He wants me to please him? I think my mouth drops open. Please, Christian Grey. And I realise in that moment that yes, that's exactly what I want to do. I want him to be damn delighted with me. It's a revelation. In very simple terms, I want you to want to please me, he says softly. His voice is hypnotic. How do I do that? My mouth is dry and I wish I had more wine. Okay, I understand the pleasing bit, but I am, but I am puzzled by the Elizabethan torture setup. Do I want to know the answer? I have rules and I want you to comply with them. They are for your benefit and for my pleasure. If you follow these rules to my satisfaction, I shall reward you. If you don't, I shall punish you, and you will learn, he whispers. I glance at the rack of canes as he says this, and where does all this fit in? I wave my hand in the general direction of the room. It's all part of the incentive package, both reward and punishment. So you'll get your kicks by exerting your will over me. It's about gaining your trust and to respect, so you'll let me exert my will over you. I will gain a great deal of pleasure, joy, even in your submission. The more you submit, the greater my joy. It's as simple as that. Okay. And what do I get out of this? He shrugs and looks almost apologetic. Me, he says simply. Oh my, Christian rakes his hand through his hair as he gazes at me. You're not giving anything away, Anastasia, he murmurs, expirated. Let's go back downstairs where I can concentrate better. It's very distracting having you in here. He holds his hand out to me and now I'm hesitant to take it. Kate had said he was dangerous. She was so right. How did she know? He's dangerous to my health because I know I'm going to say yes. And part of me doesn't want to. Part of me wants to run screaming from this room. And in all represents. I am so out of my depth here. I'm not going to hurt you, Anastasia. I know he speaks the truth. I take his hand and he leads me out the door. If you do this, let me show you, rather than going back downstairs. He turns right out of the playroom, as he calls it, and down a corridor. We pass several doors until we reach the one at the end. Beyond it is a bedroom with a large double bed. All in white, everything, furniture, walls, bedding, it's sterile and cold, but with the most glorious view of Seattle through the glass wall. This will be your room. You can decorate it how you like. Have whatever you like in here. My room? You're expecting me to move in? I can't hide the honour in my voice. Not full time. Just say Friday evening through Sunday. We have to talk about all that. Negotiate. If you want to do this, he adds. His voice quiet and hesitant. I'll sleep here. Yes. Not with you. No. I told you, I don't sleep with anyone. Except when you're st stupefied with drink. His voice is reprimanding. My mouth press is in a hard line. This is what I cannot reconcile. Kind, caring Christian who rec rescues me from inebriation and holds me gently while I'm throwing up. And the monster who possesses whips and chains in a special room. Where do you sleep? My room is downstairs. Come, you must be hungry. Weirdly, I seem to have lost my appetite, I murmur. You must eat, Anastasia, he scolds, and take my hand, lead me down, back downstairs. Back in the impossibly big room, I am filled with deep trepidation. I am on the edge of my seat, and I have to decide whether to jump. 
I'm fully aware that this is a dark path I'm leading you down, Anastasia. This is why I really want you to think about it. You must have some questions, he says as he wanders into the kitchen area, releasing my hand. I do, but where to start? You've signed your NDA. You can ask me anything you want and I'll answer. I stand as the breakfast bar watching him as he opens the refrigerator and pulls out a plate of different cheeses with two large bunches of green and red grapes. He sets the plate down on the worktop and proceeds to cut up a French baguette. Sit. He points to one of the stools at the breakfast bar and I obey his command. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to get used to it. I realise he's been this bossy since I met him. You mentioned paperwork. Yes. What paperwork? 